Hello, this is video number one of module five. This video covers um, the beginning part of module five, which discusses extensions of Mendelian inheritance. A little bit of background is shown on this slide. So if you recall from the previous module before the break, before all this stuff came about, we were talking about Mendelian inheritance. Mendel, discovered the basic rules of inheritance and published his work in 1866. It was largely unrecognized and um, was discovered in 1900 independently by three different scientists. And then only then was appreciated for the importance of the work. Um, after its rediscovery, many people uh, took to uh, looking at the rules of inheritance in various different types of organisms and found uh, that they um, mostly supported what Mendel found, but also there were extensions of stuff that he didn't observe. So these are the extensions that we're talking about. And um, um, there's a list of those, and that list is on the next slide here. And um, I'm going to break this down into two main types of extensions. This list is extensions for um, traits determined by a single gene. And the second list um, will describe extensions for traits determined by two genes. All right, so stuff that Mendel didn't see basically is what this list is. Um, and briefly, um, Mendel always saw in his experiments with pea plants what's called complete dominance. Always when he crossed two different um, pure breeding lines for a trait, for example, pea color, crossing yellow to green, he always saw that one trait was dominant to the other. In the F1 of a yellow times a green cross, he always saw yellow plants. Um, so that's called complete dominance. There are uh, different versions of dominance, though, so incomplete and codominance, and we'll talk about those. Another thing that Mendel didn't see was genes with more than two alleles. He always uh, saw only two alleles. He didn't observe pleiotropies, which is when a gene can um, contribute to traits, uh, more than one trait. He didn't observe uh, genes with recessive lethal alleles, or delayed lethality. Uh, he didn't observe incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Those terms have to do with, uh, for a given genotype, there's variation in expression of the phenotype. So we'll talk about those. Mendel didn't observe what are called conditional alleles, in which the phenotype of a given genotype is influenced by some environmental conditions. He didn't observe sex-limited and sex-influenced traits, mainly because pea plants don't have sexes, all yet pea plants have both male and female reproductive structures in the same flower. And for that same reason, he didn't really observe sex-linked traits. Pea plants don't have sex chromosomes. And he didn't observe um, traits determined by genes in the organelles. For example, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have genes, and some of those genes can result in traits. So those are the main examples we're going to cover. In the first three, uh, I think three videos. And uh, before we do that, though, I want to... Uh, oh, so this is for what I will talk about in this video. First, I'm going to start out with some introduction to terminology uh, having to do with alleles and genes, uh, basic terminology. And then I'm going to start going into the list of the extensions of Mendelian genetics. So for this video, different types of dominance is the main topic. All right, terminology. Um, so I got out my whiteboard and tried to uh, make some definitions for terminology having to do with different types of alleles. Here's the main terminology. Uh, a wild type allele 
is an allele. Uh, that's the most common allele in a population. And a wild type allele encodes a protein that's functional. If a wild type allele uh, has a mutation, oftentimes that mutation, well, it will produce a mutant allele. And usually the mutant alleles produce either a partial or complete loss of function of the encoded protein. If it produces a partial loss of function, that's referred to as a hypomorphic mutant allele. If it produces a complete loss of function, that's referred to as a null allele no function. Occasionally, rarely, a mutation will produce what's called a neomorphic allele. A neomorphic allele is when the mutation produces a protein that has a new function, neo, new function. That's pretty rare. All right, terminology having to do with genes. And uh, the main thing I want to talk about here is haplosufficient versus haploinsufficient genes. Now, uh, most genes can be classified as haplosufficient genes. And what that means, if you break that term down, haplo having one copy, haploid, one copy of a wild type allele is enough, it's sufficient, to generate the wild type phenotype, haplosufficient. Let's go through an example of a gene. It's a hypothetical gene A with two alleles. And one allele, A1, is the wild type allele. That's producing a functional protein. A2 is an null allele, no functional protein results. What happens if we make the different genotypic combinations of these alleles? So homozygous for A1, wild type allele, that's going to produce the wild type phenotype. Homozygous for A2, the null allele, is going to produce the mutant phenotype. If you are heterozygous, you have one functional allele, wild type, and one null allele. The phenotype is wild type because, by definition, for haplosufficient genes, having one copy of a wild type allele is sufficient to produce the wild type phenotype. So for haplosufficient genes, the wild type allele is dominant to the null allele. Okay. How about for haploinsufficient genes? Haploinsufficient genes, one wild type copy is not enough, not sufficient to show the wild type phenotype. Another hypothetical example, this case with gene B, two alleles, B1 is a wild type allele producing functional protein. B2 is the null allele producing no functional protein. If we make different uh, allelic combinations of these two alleles, homozygous for B1, has two copies of the wild type gene, and that will produce the wild type phenotype. Homozygous for B2, two null alleles producing the mutant phenotype. If you're heterozygous for a haplosufficient gene, you have one wild type copy and one null copy, but one wild type copy is not enough. It's insufficient. And so a heterozygote will also produce the mutant phenotype. So, for genes that are haploinsufficient, what this means is that the null allele, B2, is dominant to the wild type allele, B1. Um, haplosufficient genes, then, surprisingly, the null allele is dominant to the wild type allele. Now, what's the explanation for this difference? So, you can think of it in this way the dose of different uh, wild type alleles. It can vary from zero to one to two, depending on the genotype. If you have one or two doses of a wild type allele for a haplosufficient gene, for the A gene that we just looked at, you show the wild type phenotype. So there's some threshold below one, below which you show the mutant phenotype. We don't know exactly where this threshold is, but you know, we know if you have one wild type allele, you show wild type. If you have zero, you show the mutant phenotype, haplosufficient. For haplosufficient genes, the threshold is less than one. For haploinsufficient genes, having one or zero copies results in the mutant phenotype. 
you only see the wild type phenotype if you have two doses of the wild type allele. So the threshold for haploinsufficient genes is greater than one. It's somewhere here, uh, but if you are less than, uh, if you have one or zero copies of the wild type allele, you're going to show the mutant phenotype. So for haploinsufficient genes, the threshold is greater than one. Haplosufficient genes, the threshold is less than one. What types of genes are haplosufficient or haploinsufficient? Um, most genes are haplosufficient. You can think of enzymes. Enzymes are haplosufficient. Genes encoding enzymes, if you have one or two doses of those in wild type form, then usually that's enough. Because remember, enzymes are catalytic proteins, and catalytic proteins can catalyze more than one reaction. And um, if you cut the dose of those pro uh, genes in half, it's not really going to affect the phenotype. Genes that produce regulatory proteins, though, are typically haploinsufficient. Regulatory proteins, for example, proteins that regulate uh, gene expression, transcription, for example, they're usually produced in very low amounts. And so if you cut their dose in half, they're going to fall below the threshold uh, for the wild-type phenotype. All right, uh, so let's leave the uh, introduction, the terminology, and let's get to the list of uh, extensions of Mendelian genetics. Okay, the first example, and the only one we'll cover in this video, has to do with variations on dominance. Mendel always saw complete dominance, and complete dominance, when he crossed two pure breeding plants, he got a heterozygous plant in the F1. And he always saw that the heterozygote resembled one homozygous class. For example, crossing yellow peas to green peas, the F1 always resembled the yellow peas. Okay, and complete dominance, one trait is completely masked, and the heterozygote resembles one of the homozygous um, groups. And some it could be either, uh, in this case, is crossing a white to a blue, and the heterozygote is resembling the white. Or it could be white to the blue, and the heterozygote is resembling the blue. But always in complete dom dominance, the heterozygote is, re is resembling one of the homozygotes. All right, uh, types of dominance that Mendel didn't see are these two, incomplete dominance and codominance. In incomplete dominance, the heterozygote is intermediate in phenotype between the two homozygotes. In this case, white and blue, the two, two homozygous classes, if you produce a heterozygote, it's this kind of light blue in between them. In complete dominance, the heterozygote is intermediate in phenotype. In codominance, if you cross homozygotes for two different um, traits, for one trait showing two different phenotypes, white times blue here, codominance, the heterozygote dis displays uh, features of both homozygotes. So homozygous for white, cross to homozygous for blue, the heterozygote will show patches of both white and blue. Some examples of those for incomplete dominance. Snapdragon is an example of that. Homozygotes produce white flowers, and there's another homozygote for a different allele producing red flowers. All right, these are both pure breeding. If we cross them, we'll get a heterozygote in which the flower color is intermediate between red and white, pink flowers. Here's how that cross would work. And again, these are the phenotypes here. White homozygous for one allele, R2. Red homozygous for a different allele, R1. They're alleles of the same gene. Uh, if you cross pure breeding red to pure breeding white, you'll get a heterozygote with one allele each showing the pink phenotype, intermediate. If you did do a monohybrid cross, essentially what Mendel did and, and self the F1s here, cross pink to pink, you'll see in the F2 generation 
this ratio, 1 to 2 to 1. 1 quarter are going to be homozygous for the R1 allele in red. 1 quarter are going to be homozygous for the R2 allele in white. 1 half will be heterozygous and pink. So in incomplete dominance, the genotypic ratio, 1 to 2 to 1, is reflected in the phenotypic ratio, 1 to 2 to 1. Uh, why is there incomplete dominance in snapdragons? Well, uh, because there's an enzyme involved in producing the pigment. If you have more of that enzyme, um, two of the wild type alleles, you produce more intense pigmentation, red. If you are heterozygous, you have one wild type allele and one null allele, you don't produce as much pigment, pink. And uh, this should be little a, little a, my apologies. If you're homozygous for the null allele, you produce no pigment, white. Okay, a couple of examples of co-dominance. This one is in uh, lentils. Lentils are plants that produce seeds and the seeds have um, these blotches on their surface. And the blotching pattern is determined by a, a single gene, the C gene. If you have the S allele of the C gene and you're homozygous, you produce these really large splotches. So that's called the spotted phenotype. If you're homozygous for the D allele, you produce these tiny uh, dots. That's called the dotted phenotype. If you cross pure breeding spotted to pure breeding dotted, in the F1, you will see heterozygotes, one of each allele. And you will also see that the heterozygotes display features of both homozygotes classes, both the large splotches and the tiny dots. If you do a um, cross between F1s, so heterozygote times heterozygote, you will see a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio in the phenotype. One quarter spotted, large spot splotches. One quarter dotted, small dots. One half, both spotted and dotted. And again, in this case, just like in incomplete dominance, um, the phenotypic ratio, one to two to one, is reflecting the genotypic ratio, one to two to one. Another famous example of codominance is for the genes controlling antigens for the AB blood type. AB blood type is due to expression on the surface of red blood cells of uh, glycoprotein antigens. And there are two varieties, either A or B, and these are determined by alleles at the I gene. If you have our homozygous for the IA allele, you produce only A antigens, IA homozygote here. If you're homozygous for the IB allele, you produce only B antigens, homozygous for the B. If these individuals have a child, he will be or she will be heterozygous and will display both A and B antigens, blood type AB. Um, and therefore, that's an example of codominance. All right, that's all for this video. And the next video, we'll pick up the list again for more examples of Mendelian extensions or extension, extensions of Mendelian inheritance. See ya.